So, all right, so Hezekiah, and I spelt it right, I think. We can go on to the next slide. So we're gonna have, a, I think, a good discussion about Hezekiah, but something told me to do this just for fun, totally unrelated to Hezekiah. Now we can go through these slides quickly, well, but I thought you might wanna see some pictures. All right. So why don't we, that's me as a kid, and that's my father. I thought you would get a real kick out of that. That's, that's my dad before he passed away a while ago, but, but that's me and my dad there. Go on to the next one. This is my mom. Uh, she lived down in Florida. That's me with my first communion, and uh, that's her at her 80th birthday. So I just thought you'd like to see my family roots. Keep it going. We got them. I was once a kid just like you. And I want you to know, in, in 1978, the big glasses were, were, were cool. I was very cool. I had much longer hair. Uh, my father gave up trying to tell me to get a haircut, so he just let me go out of the stage. But that was my student ID from 1978. All right, keep going. That, this is a priest who had a big impact on my life um, at college, Father Oopsies. He's since passed away. He was a biblical scholar. And... Um, I didn't appreciate it till years later, but he often went on trips to the Middle East and, and uh, he took one of Paul's journeys and he always came back with slides. And I guess looking back on it, this got me really excited to learn more. So we'll just keep going, just a couple of more. That's me getting married. I thought you'd like a picture of that. Go on, hit the next one. That's my sister and my mom. My sister and I are very, very close. She's had a big impact on my, on my life. That's the crew. So that's my wife. And then I have four kids, three sons and a daughter. So go on. Uh, a little bit more recent picture. That's my son as a boy. That's Brendan, Professor Maz. Professor Maz and I have spoken about this. And the next picture, I think, is the last. These are my, my other two sons and my daughter. And I think that might be it. I think. Yes. Okay. So I thought I would just start out with just a bunch of pictures so you know a little bit more about me and where I come. All right, so Hezekiah, I really enjoyed learning about King Hezekiah. I had almost no knowledge, and hopefully I have enough knowledge to, to help us all tonight, but I'm looking forward to discussions and uh, questions. All right, let's take it away. All right, so first of all, what I had to do was a little bit of background. Now, I suspect most all of you know this, but I just wanted to write it down to make sure that, that I had the right story. So, we're going to be running across the word Judah a lot tonight. So I said, I better make sure I, I, I got this right. So Judah was uh, the fourth son of Jacob and his first wife, Leah. So he was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So I got that part. Now, the next name that I thought was interesting was Joshua, as I'm sure all of you know, but I wanted to write it down anyway. Joshua replaced Moses as the leader. And upon entering the promised land, he assigned a section of land to each one of the 12 tribes, which are the 12 uh, descendants of the 12, um, um, uh, 12 children of uh, Judah and, the, uh, of, uh, and of, uh, of uh, Jacob, pardon me. And the tribe of Judah, see, now we're, now we're getting closer to Hezekiah. The tribe of Judah is the, was assigned the land, uh, the region south of uh, Jerusalem. And... Perhaps this became the most powerful and most important tribe. This is where David and Solomon, and of course, most importantly, the Messiah was descended of. All right, All right we'll hit the next one. So I needed a little bit more background to fit in where Hezekiah was, was going to be joining us in this puzzle. So it turns out that uh, there was a Northern and Southern kingdom and in right around 721 BC, and by the way, these dates are within plus or minus a year or two. Uh, there seems to be some discrepancy depending upon some sources. So the Assyrians, uh, which who were on the move, uh, con uh, uh, conquered the Northern Kingdom in about 721 BC. So 10 of the tribes were then dispersed. Now, it turns out in the southern kingdom of Judah, that was still a thriving area until it was conquered by the Babylonians in around 587, 586 BC. The captives were led into exile. And as I suspect you all know, the Persians conquered Babylonia in 539 BC. And Cyrus the Great 
allowed the Jews to return back to uh, their homeland. So those are the pieces of the puzzle that I just needed to write down to make sure that I had the big picture. So if we go on to the next slide, where does Hezekiah fit in? So Hezekiah was around in the late eighth century and early seventh century BC. So um, he was born around 741 BC and he died at the age of 54 at 687 BC. So he, um, he had the opportunity to witness the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. And he was king of Judah during a very important siege of Jerusalem around 701 BC. So it turns out, where did he come from? Who were his parents? His, he was the son of Ahaz, and he turned out to be the 13th uh, successor of David as the king of Judah. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. I, I, I got the tribe of Judah. I got the southern kingdom. I know the northern kingdom was conquered, and I'm able to, to fit the pieces together. A little bit about um, Hezekiah's dad. Um, he abandoned the worship of our Lord in favor of Baal, one of the foreign pagan gods. Now, this is going to have a big impact upon Hezekiah's life. Um, Hezekiah was king and grew up in a, in a region and in a time period where there was a lot of conflict and there was a lot of uh, pressure from the Assyrians who didn't uh, accept Yahweh. They had their own pagan gods. So there was this clash between uh, the opposing culture and uh, the quest to be Jewish. So uh, Ahaz uh, pretty much um, became a vassal of the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria pretty much had control over most, if not all, of uh, Palestine. So Hezekiah became the king when he was about 25 years old. So it's a kind of a very tumultuous area. Um, as I mentioned, he saw the, the, the uh, destruction of the kingdom of Israel, and we're going to talk about the siege coming up. How am I doing on the history so far? Am I doing okay? All right, okay. Good. So if we go on to the next slide, um, I thought the name Hezekiah was interesting, and depending upon how you translate it, it means Yahweh strengthens or Yahweh is my strength. Now, it turns out there's no book of Hezekiah in the Old Testament, as you know. So he shows up in at least three books pretty prominently. Uh, two Kings, Two Chronicles, and Isaiah. Turns out that he and Isaiah were buddies. And they, uh, so Isaiah was prophesizing during the time of Hezekiah. Also, Micah was also prophesizing during his reign. So there's a, a couple of very interesting stories, which I kind of summarized here. And we're going to see what, what the impact was on Hezekiah of different events in his life. So the main events in Hezekiah's life, you can pick three of them. So here he is king, um, surrounded by a hostile force. Northern kingdom is gone. And he's pretty much it. So... His father had introduced um, worships of idol, idols and pagan beliefs, and this was even done in the temple. So when Hezekiah became king, uh, he introduced, as pointed out here, both religious reforms and restoration of the temple. So what struck me about this is he was going against culture. He, he was probably not going to win any popularity contest when he first started this. So he gave a strict mandate for the, the, the sole worship of Yahweh. And he wanted the removals of the idols and the cults of the Assyrian gods. Now, it's interesting. It was his father who okayed all this. So when Hezekiah took over, he got, he got rid of all the, the items that his father had done in terms of the religious of the religious reforms. Next, the restoration of the temple. And um, as, I was, as I was reading this, I, I couldn't help but think of the story of our Lord uh, who got the whip and said, you know, my, my father's house is meant to be a house of prayer. 
it, this was almost a foreshadowing, I thought of that. So the restoration of the, of the temple, all the idols were gone. Um, the temple became the central place of worship again. And also the, Pas the Passover pilgrimage had stopped. So he reinstituted that. So the first big event that I was kind of gravitating towards was Hezekiah was getting back to the roots and he was centralizing around Yahweh and the religious reforms and the restoration of the temple. So that was item number one that kind of struck me. Any comments, questions so far I can help on? We're all good. All right. So if I continue on with this, the, the next big event was the Assyrians eventually uh, started an invasion. So to have the right perspective, about 20 years prior, they had conquered the Northern Kingdom. And right around year 701 BC, they came after the Southern Kingdom. And um, what happened was the king of Syria, Sennacherib, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, he was the one that was coming after Jerusalem and Judah. And, uh, uh, and, and Hezekiah, what did he do? So Hezekiah did a couple of things. Pray to God for deliverance. Second, he paid a tribute to the Assyrian king. And the Assyrian king lifted the siege. But that's not the end of the story. Right? So if we go to the next slide, we get a little bit more detail. The king of Assyria ascended to the throne about 705 BC after his father passed. And in 701, he was on the war path. And he had conquered most of Judah. And uh, according to what I read, that was about 46 walled cities. So Jerusalem was coming up next on the list. And that's where Hezekiah was. So Hezekiah paid a tribute to the Assyrian king, gold and silver, and it was accepted. But the Assyrian king said, you still have to do unconditional surrender to me, which meant they had to deny Yahweh. And they had to accept the Assyrian gods. Okay. So um, it looks as if uh, King Hezekiah is in a real bind, right? He's surrounded by superior forces. Um, many, many other wall cities have fallen. He tried paying a tribute. It didn't work. And the, the king of Assyria kept the tribute. And now they're coming after Hezekiah. So if we go and say, well, what's, what happens next? the king of Assyria renewed his assault. So he's back on. And what did Hezekiah do? So this is like, to me, the key point of the second event. What did Hezekiah do? So he returned to the temple and he prayed. Secondly, he took action. He constructed a tunnel system, which they have unearthed it. And if you go to Google, you can see pictures of it. It's quite amazing. I think all of us, whether we're in engineering or not, would be quite amazed. These tunnels were built to provide underground access to warders outside the city. Because once the siege started, that's it. They won't be able to get out. And he also put up a defensive wall to protect the reservoir, the broad wall, parts of which are still uh, unearthed in uh, 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 Jerusalem. So he prayed. He took specific action to protect his people. And God sent an angel the night before what they thought would be the battle. And the angel struck down 185,000 people in the Assyrian camp. And the Assyrian king went away. Now, if you read it in the Bible, they said it was an angel. If you read it in secular sources, they say it was a miraculous plague. So whichever one you want to believe, 185,000 soldiers were struck and uh, the Assyrian king retreated and wound up never entering Jerusalem. So this, this was the second big event. Again, the first um, event and the second event, the, the, the first event, as I mentioned, um, and the second event here, the, the, the two big ones, uh, the restoration of the temple and, and the religious reform. And now this, these were two big events. There's one more to go. 
So if I, if I go to the next one, the third big event in Hezekiah's life that's recorded in the Bible is his illness and recovery. So he had an inflammation. In most translations, it says a boil. And the prophet Isaiah, imagine you know, going to a doctor and hearing this. Um, put your house in order. This is it. It's over. So that's what Isaiah told uh, Hezekiah. So Hezekiah prayed. He cried. He prayed. Uh, and, and God heard his prayer, told Isaiah, go back and tell him, I'm going to let him live. He's fine. And the promise was that he would live for 15 more years, which he did. So he lived for 15 more years. And um, it was interesting. Hezekiah, when he heard that Isaiah said, you're going to live, Hezekiah said, can, you, can God give me a sign? You know, can God give me some proof of this? And it turns out that uh, um, Isaiah said, the shadow on these steps will go back by 10 steps during the day. So there's these very famous steps. Forgive me, I, I, I haven't been there, so I don't know, but by, built by King Ahaz. And on, this, on the steps built by King Ahaz, uh, the sign that um, Hezekiah was going to get was that the shadow would go back 10 steps. And it did. So Hezekiah said, this is great. I'm going to live. Now, an interesting event happened here. The king of Babylon, the king of Babylon heard about this miraculous recovery and paid, uh, sent ambassadors uh, to, uh, I know I say king, it should have been ambassadors, I beg your pardon. Uh, the ambassadors showed up from, um, from, from uh, Babylon and uh, Hezekiah was feeling really good. And he gave the ambassadors from Babylon a tour of Jerusalem and showed them the wealth of the city, um, all the great fortresses. And um, Isaiah said, why did you do that? And Isaiah prophesied that a future generation would be taken captive by the, same, by the very same Babylonians. And uh, Hezekiah lived another 15 years after the illness. So let me pause. I've given a little bit of history, mostly for myself, to make sure I knew what I was talking about. I gave a little bit of structure as to where Hezekiah fits in. And the three big events, the religious and temple, religious reform and temple restoration, um, the Assyrian conflict, and then the illness and the recovery. How are we doing so far? Or am I doing okay? We, we got it. All right. So if we go on to the next one. All right. I was thinking, what, what can I learn from these three events? And this is where I would, I would welcome your guidance and uh, see if there's anything here that, that we can discuss. You don't have to. I'm not going to call on anyone like I would in class. But uh, if anyone would like to, you know, kind of join the discussion, that would be great. So I went back and I said, okay, what's event one? The religious reform and the restoration of the temple. So I said, you know, what, what lesson does this have for me? So trying to bring it into the century we're in and make it personal for me. So I was impressed that Hezekiah stood up and resisted the culture. Um, and you know, today I find, I don't know about you, but I think the last few years, I think at times the world has gone upside down. Uh, all the stuff I used to think was everyone kind of agreed on. It's no longer true. I, it's like, like, whoa. So I could kind of relate to this, that, that Hezekiah took over a country that worshiped idols, even in the temple and said, that's it. It stops. And he stood up to that. And he removed all the idols. So I, I started asking myself some, some questions. And I, I guess I still have to kind of come up with answers. But the questions I was asking myself is, am I standing up to the culture? Am I proclaiming the Lord? And um, am I doing his will for me? 
And, you know, I know I have a weakness. I like to be liked. Maybe we all do. But, you know, um, you, if you stand up, sometimes you give all that up. So I have to look at myself and say, am I staying true to our Lord? And am I doing what he wants me to do? And then the second question I came to was say, well, I don't have a golden idol, but what are my idols? Is it money? Is it trusting technology? So I, I, I started asking myself, do I trust someone or something more than God? You know, what do I do when I need to go and get an anchor? Do I rely on technology? Do I say, okay, money? Uh, so what I got out of event one was how Hezekiah stood up to the culture, didn't do a poll, wasn't trying to win a, a popularity contest. He did what he had to do. And then, um, you know, uh, he, he got rid of all the idols and there shall be no idols, but the Lord your God. I don't know. That, that got me thinking a lot. And I just want to pause. You don't have to say anything, but I'm wondering if someone wants to add or subtract to that or if I'm resonating or if I'm not resonating. What do you think? Yes. Right. Good. Good. My colleagues, I know we have more comments, but just for the people online, uh, an excellent comment from our uh, colleague here and our brother uh, that, you know, even the idol gods of the Assyrians had many of the human qualities that are idols to us today, whether it's fame or power or, or wealth. Thank you. Excellent. I thought I saw another hand go up. I could be. Yes. Excellent comment. So for those online or for those at the back who may not have heard, it was an excellent comment about timidity and uh, the profession of our faith. And sometimes in a new environment, some of us might feel timid as to how we would um, express our, our, our faith to others. Great. Did I see a hand go up in the back or am I mistaken? Okay. So that was event one. So it got me thinking about um, profession of faith, um, doing things that are going against the culture if I feel it's God's will, and uh, what are the idols in my life? Okay. So if I go on to event two. Okay. So event two was the uh, Assyrian invasion. So I look at that and I say, event two, Assyrian invasion. So the possible lessons. Um, I really liked the, the, the three things that Hezekiah did. So the three things were that um, the armies are coming. Invasion is pretty imminent. Hezekiah went to Isaiah, a man of God, a prophet, and sought advice. He prayed. And the third thing is he was a man of action. He built the tunnels for the, for, the, for the water outside the walls, and he built an extra wall to defend the reservoir. So I, I, I thought, this is, this is pretty good. So I say, wait a minute. Now, he, he prayed. He sought the advice of counsel of a, of a godly person, and he then took action. That's good. I really like that. Now, 
What I also like about Hezekiah is that he's not perfect because I'm not. So it turns out that Hezekiah, his first reaction was to try to pay off the, uh, the Assyrians. So that didn't work out. By the way, that's what his father tried to do also. So, um, so maybe, maybe his trust in our Lord was not 100%, at least maybe at the beginning, maybe. So he, he, he tried buying his way out of trouble and it didn't happen. The trouble kept, kept, kept coming. So he, he, he prayed, sought the advice of a godly person and then um, took some action. And that, those three things kind of struck me. So I started thinking, okay, let me ask myself questions. Again, I don't know if I have all these answers. I like to think I do, but when difficult times hit me, what do I do? Do I stop praying because I get down on myself and I feel unworthy and I don't know what to do? Do I continue to trust in the Lord and pray? I'm guilty of not doing that all the time. Um, do I allow the great deceiver or Satan to enter my heart? And, and uh, he's, 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 um, he's pretty good. You know, I start feeling bad for myself. Well, how could this happen? Um, oh, it's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. I, I have resentment. I start imagining these lies. And uh, so it goes back to the first question. What do I do or who do I go to when I have difficult times? And the next to last question says, who are the people of God in my life? Who do I go to for godly counsel? You know. So my suggestion is I think all of us should kind of know the answer to these questions, or at least be working on the answers. Because Hezekiah did three things, prayed, sought godly counsel, and took action. So he didn't sit in a room like I sometimes do and say, oh man, what am I going to do? I'm overwhelmed. I'm just, I don't know what's going to happen. He took action. And the last thing is, kind of goes back to the first point about the uh, revival and going against culture. What do I really place or who do I place my trust in during difficult times? You know, do I place my trust in, um, I don't know, whatever it is. Do I, do I find other things rather than our Lord to put my, my uh, trust in? So I got to be careful. So the second event in Hezekiah's life got me thinking about, you know, maybe the plan of action should be to pray, seek the counsel of godly people, and then act. Instead of just saying, oh, woe is me, and I'm overwhelmed, and I, I, I just can't do this, uh, the bottom is falling out of my life. So I don't know. That's what I got out of the second big event in Hezekiah's life. Let me pause. Again, you don't have to say anything, but does someone want to add or subtract anything? Am I looking at it right or wrong? What do you think? Yes. Great. You, uh, uh, my colleagues online, uh, one of our, our, our brothers here just brought up some great stuff. It starts out with maybe the flood of emotions, maybe negative thoughts, negative feelings, but you have the discipline and will. And I, I think this is great where you're able to say stop and you turn to God and you pray. And then you mentioned you turn to your parents and then you get back in, back in gear. That's, you know, I can relate that to exactly what Hezekiah did about 2,800 years ago. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Uh, anything else, any other sub additions, subtractions? Yes.
I love what you just said. One of our uh, brothers here just said, it's action after prayer. You know, the minute you said that, I, I, I thought of something. So I'm teaching this first year course on Python. And it's a lot of fun. And everyone is so eager, you know? So I say, let's write a program that can find the square root of a quadratic. You know what everyone does? Opens up the PC and starts typing the program. And a computer scientist would go, ah, you're supposed to like think about what's the formula you're going to use, you know, like sketch out a little, you know, bullet list or do pseudocode or so it's like, I think in, for some of us, the first reaction is action. And I see that with the first year students who are great. They just want to dive in and do it. But I have to kind of slow them down and say, first of all, let's just pause. And what's the best way to do this, you know? So um, prayer, and for me, I guess it would be prayer, counsel, and action. Thank you, another great point. I'm enjoying this. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Great, a wonderful contribution from one of our sisters here about saying um, it's important to be patient and to wait for a response. And what's happened in my life is uh, I've gone to people who I trust, who I know are people of faith. And I think God has spoken through them to me. So the prayer, the, the, the counsel and the action, that's, that seems to work. But patience is tough. Uh, especially today, because I know it's everything is faster. So we have, I think I have less patience as I, I've gotten older. So patience is tough. I agree. Thank you. Good. Anything else? So far, so good. Oh, another comment from the back in left field. That was great. And I want to just share your verse. I'm sorry. You said Romans 5. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Thank you very much. I bought a pen and paper to write down stuff. So I'm going to write that down. Thank you very much. Good. Are we doing okay so far with the first two? All right. We got one more to go. All right. One more. So if I go on to event number three, the illness and recovery. So uh, he had the boil, which was a serious inflammation. Isaiah said, it doesn't look good. And uh, I say, okay, what are the possible lessons I can learn from this story? Again, uh, Hezekiah was faithful <clears throat> in that he prayed. And then he trusted in the Lord. Now, a number of commentators have made this little statement, so I thought I would throw it in. They say that, well, Hezekiah was not perfect because he asked for a sign. I guess if you completely trusted, you wouldn't have asked for a sign at all. So he asked for the sign, and that's where the shadow went back 10 steps and the whole bit. Um, but also, and it's actually quite beautiful, if you haven't read it, <clears throat> in Isaiah, there's uh, Hezekiah's prayer of... Um, faith and thanksgiving, a proclamation to all who was around him as to what the Lord did for him. I thought it was very, very beautiful. Um, and um, again, he's not perfect because he had a lot of pride in showing off the treasures of people who a, a generation or so later would come back and um, take over Jerusalem and take away captives. Now, the other thing is, if you read Isaiah 39, 3 through 8, Isaiah goes to Hezekiah 
and says, you know, why did you show the Babylonians? He goes, well, I, I, I showed them everything. And um, that's when Isaiah prophesies that a future generation will be captive by the Babylonians and taken away. And uh, Isaiah said, it's not going to happen in your 15 or so years remaining. And it was interesting. Hezekiah said, that's good. So the question became, wasn't Hezekiah bothered that it's going to happen? It was interesting that, that it's a little ambiguous there that he maybe was not as concerned, although he may have been. And um, his son, Manasseh, didn't work out right. Manasseh um, undid most of the reforms and promoted the, the, the pagan gods. So I look at all of this and I say, all right, I find it, again, the questions on the bottom. I find it easy to pray to God when things are going good. When things are going bad, I get depressed. And I, I'm saying, okay, so do I pray to the Lord in good times and bad? And I said to myself, let me focus on pride. Where has pride got in the way of my relationship with God? So where has pride stopped me from being humble and to come before the Lord and kneel before him? Where is my pride hurting me here? Um, the third item, and this gets back to what one of my colleagues was saying here. Sometimes I might feel hesitant to profess my faith in a hostile environment. So that also means I'm hesitant to praise God for his, uh, for his graciousness. So do I give thanks and do I let others know um, what God has done for me? Like I was talking to one of my sons about how thankful I am to be here and to teach. And I said, you know, I thank God for that. And he said to me, oh no, but you did all the hard work. And I said, yeah, I worked hard, but who do you think taught me to teach? Who gave me the ability to do what I do? And who opened the door for me here? It wasn't me. So that opened up a whole discussion that, you know, I mean, you all know this because you're here, but the talents we have, they're, they're from above. And I, I, I started saying to myself, how many times do I say that privately? But more importantly, how many times do I say it publicly? you know, to other people. So that was an opportunity with my son and opened up a big discussion, which I, 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 I hope helped. And the last thing, going back to this Isaiah prophecy, and maybe Hezekiah wasn't concerned. Am I concerned about the next generation that's coming after me? Am I trying to leave the world a better place? I was thinking about the environment and lots of other things were, were, were coming to mind. So these were the three events and discussions. Any reaction on the third? Yes, my colleague. I love it. I want to make sure I get the verse right. I have that memorized, but I might make a mistake. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Uh, so a wonderful verse, and it kind of echoes what we're, doing, what we're saying here about the need to always give thanks. Fantastic contribution. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, my colleague. Right, I really like what our brother just said about pride can sometimes get in the way and we, we take something that we think is simple and we say, oh, we're doing this by ourselves. And, uh, you know, and, and you're pointing out that even the simplest of things, even taking breath is something we should be grateful for. Thank you. Another comment, yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Poof. Right. 
Now I'm going to interrupt you because he said a great point. I know you have a second point. So my colleagues, our brother here just brought up a great point. He's, he, he says the thing about the sign reminded him of Luke 10. And, we're, we're, and I'm paraphrasing, Lord said, oh, you wicked generation are always asking for signs. So we seem as humans to want to have a sign, a tangible sign. And you said something very powerful, which I want to echo back. God just wants us to know he's God and he's with us. Thank you. You had a second point, I think, sir. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's the fact that in those rare, those rare moments where I think I feel myself in those bad times where I really want to be in the and the good times are just left in the not life itself is just like it's it's destroying itself. That's beautiful. I want to echo that back. So when you're humbling yourself, going before the Lord and giving thanks and praise, it brings you uh, an indescribable peace, no matter what the waters are or turmoil around you are. Thank you. All right, fantastic. I'm enjoying this so much. We only have a little bit more to go, but are we doing okay? Great. All right, good. Anything else? Any other comments on this? Yes, my colleague. Right, so you're saying both ways. You might pray when things are bad, and then someone might forget to give thanks and to honor God when things are going good. Great, thank you. All right, so those are the three events. I think we're up to the summary, but let's uh, head back. All right, so kind of wrapping it up, um, what I got out of learning Hezekiah, and again, my thanks to all of you for asking me to do Hezekiah. I went from spelling him to know a little bit of, more about him. So it turns out that uh, according to what I read in some commentaries, Hezekiah receives more mention in Kings and Chronicles than anyone since Solomon. Okay, so that's, 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 that's pretty good. Uh, he also had a central role in the book of Isaiah. Now, during his reign, and I, when I read this, I couldn't help but think of how divided our, our, our country is along so many lines. There was one king, one people, one temple. Very different than I think what we're experiencing in this country now. And a number of people pointed out that, that Hezekiah is a real model for those who want to put their trust in the Lord. But again, he's not perfect, which gives me comfort because I'm not perfect. So if I mess up, I can just keep going back. So the, the, uh, he saw prayer as a chief weapon, as a defense against the, uh, the, the evil one. He wasn't perfect. But the last line is, I suspect, what all of us do. We, 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 we pray, we trust, and we repent. All right, so I think the summary slide is next. So here's what I thought I got out of this discussion tonight. I got wonderful feedback from you. So I understood better the historical background that I studied back when I was your age. It's been a while since I've looked at it, so it was nice. Uh, so the three main events recorded in the Bible is the religious reform, the Assyrian invasion, and illness and recovery. And I thought I could get something out of each of them. Do I go against the culture and speak when I should speak? Um, do I have any idols in my life? And is pride or something else holding me back? So um, that, that's it. Now, do you have any other, I, that's it. Do you have any other comments you want to add or subtract to what we've discussed? I hope this was helpful. It was helpful for me. Thank you, everybody, very, very much. Thanks. I'll get out of your way now. Another round of applause for Professor Kevin Ryan. All right, thank you so much once again for that awesome message today, connecting it in our 
lives in a, in a very personal way, which was very cool for, you know, a very old story. So thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us for all that research and effort you put into this today. We really appreciate it. So now we're just going to wrap up with the closing announcements and election results. Uh, of course, our upcoming events this week, tomorrow, Thursday, we have small groups, 7 p.m. in the North Building. Uh, we have Reclaim the Morning, Friday at 8 a.m. in the Quiet Space, and our big event, Operation Christmas Child, 6 to 10 p.m. in Babio 104. And our next GVM will not be next Wednesday because that's Thanksgiving break. Hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Uh, but our next GVM will be the week after, uh, December 1st, 2021. Sarah Esselborn uh, from the Navigators will be coming in to speak about Mary and Joseph as we're closing in uh, almost at Christmas on the road to Christ. Uh, but here is the moment that you guys have been waiting for. Have some election results for the four positions that have run. Uh, so first up uh, for our secretary position, our winner is Marisa. And treasurer, big suspense here for our new treasurer, Trevor. Next up is vice president, and our winner for that is going to be Sydney. And last but certainly not least, for the role of president, our new SCF president for 2022, is going to be Sophia. Of course, congratulations, everyone on the new e-board. I know you're all going to do an amazing job. And for everyone who ran, put themselves out there, but didn't win, uh, please don't worry about it. Uh, you are all really awesome candidates. And I know you all have the heart and the will to serve, which is something really, really great. And thank you for running and putting yourselves out there in that way. Of course, we do still have four appointed positions to fill uh, with the events coordinator, the social media coordinator, the outreach coordinator, and the worship coordinator. So if anyone, whether you ran or didn't, uh, talk to the new e-board, they will be making these decisions about the rest of the appointed positions very soon. Uh, so if you have an interest in a position you feel called to serve in that way, I do encourage you to think about that. Uh, but once again, thank you all for coming tonight to SCF. Thank you, Professor Ryan, for speaking. We have refreshments up front if you want to stick around for some time of fellowship. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>